Hello, my name is Sarah Peterson, and I will be presenting evidence and recommendations for practice on anal pap smears as a screening tool. This presentation was created to address the clinical problem of the lack of guidelines regarding anal pap smears for men who have sex with men. When making a decision to create evidence-based guidelines for a screening intervention, it is important to know the accuracy and the appropriateness of said intervention for the population in question. It is also important to know the statistics in terms of the disease for which one is screening. I have collected a few here to highlight the need for a routine screening tool in the identification and prevention of anal cancer for men who have sex with men. My literature search was aimed at examining the accuracy and appropriateness of anal pap smears. It did not result in any meta-analyses or randomized control trials. Admittedly, cross-sectional and cohort studies, which I did find, do not provide the highest level of evidence. These studies are limited by selection and measurement biases. They are the most ethically appropriate study designs to answer my particular PIO question, however. Anal pap smear screening is a tool intended to guide management and treatment. Randomized control trials to examine this particular intervention would involve a control group in which either the anal pap smear itself or treatment for neoplasia discovered by anal pap smears was withheld. This raises obvious ethical concerns. It is important to note that cervical pap smears were adopted as screening tools without any prior randomized control trials. There is currently a three-year cohort study called the SPANK trial, SPANK standing for Study of the Prevention of Anal Cancer, being conducted. It began in 2010 and is set to be completed in June of 2019. It is the largest study to date, and its primary outcome measure aims to determine the prevalence, incidence, and risk factors for type-specific HPV, and its secondary outcome measure aims to determine if HPV is associated with L-cell and H-cell. To be continued. After reviewing the existing evidence, my recommendation for translation to practice is as follows. For HIV-negative men who have sex with men, screening every two to three years. For HIV-positive men who have sex with men, annual screening. It is important to note that as a clinician, if you do not have access to a lab that handles anal cytology or to a provider that can perform high-resolution anoscopy, anal pap smears are not recommended. I have also created a mnemonic, which is intended to not only invite what can be a difficult conversation with your patient, but also provide education and perhaps act as a primary prevention tool. My mnemonic is named CASM, and it stands for the um, risk factors that are identified um, in terms of anal cancer and HPV. So whether or not the patient routinely uses condoms, whether or not the patient has a history of HPV infection or is HIV positive, whether or not the patient is 45 or older, smoking status, and a history of multiple partners. There's not a lot of information out there in terms of process. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there is not currently a fee for collection of anal pap that is significant enough to generate revenue. The diagnosis one could use to order the anal pap under would be high-risk sexual behavior. Um, documentation of risk assessment and education performed with the patient maybe could uh, increase revenue um, in terms of being able to upcode that visit. Um, it is also important to uh, document uh, in terms of informing further recommendations in terms of insurance coverage, I was unable to really find any information as to insurances that do or don't cover anal pap smear as a screening tool. And so in looking at the cost to patient out of pocket, I did find one source that estimated the cost to be about $130. 
And this is the procedure laid out in a step-by-step -step manner. Um, as you can see, I'll let you look that over on your own, but um, it's fairly straightforward and really does not require much in terms of time or materials. Also, it should, there's, uh, any clinician should have access to the materials necessary, which is basically the uh, synthetic swab and the um, fixative solution. In terms of resulting, what you should get back from the lab, um, the results should be purported using, reported using the Bethesda system. A lack of transition zone is considered acceptable, but could indica indicate inadequate depth of collection, uh, the recommended depth of collection being two to three inches. Normal results uh, would indicate um, one should repeat the anal pap annually in HIV positive men who have sex with men and every two to three years in HIV negative men who have sex with men. Any level of abnormal cytology reported back would require a referral for high resolution anoscopy. And that referral could be made under the ICD-10 diagnosis code listed here. In terms of evaluating practice change, these are some of the data collection points that I came up with that could be tracked. Um, they include, but are not limited to, the number of anal pap smears collected um, in the practice, how frequently an anal pap smear is performed on an individual patient, how often the ICD-10 diagnosis code of the abnormal anal cytology is made, the number of referrals to proctology made by the practice, and the documentation of the risk assessment and education made in the patient visit note. And these are my references. I have created also created a one-page handout that is intended to be a quick reference for clinicians as well as a tool for shared decision-making with your patients. I hope you have found this presentation informational. I would greatly appreciate any and all feedback and have provided an evaluation form for that purpose. Thank you.